So I'm really pleased to welcome each of you to, the, to today's webinar. Um, here on the line, we have Alistair Morris, who will be presenting on how to create a highly optimized LinkedIn profile to attract top jobs. Now, this session, it is the third out of four sessions taking place this month um, for BGA Careers Month. So I can see a few familiar names. Um, and as you would have heard, if you attend all four of our sessions live, you will go in the draw to win a prize pack. Um, and this prize pack is with Alice's company, CVIA, and it's going to be worth 300 pounds where you can put that prize money towards any of their services that's going to help you with your career. Um, it could be a CV or a LinkedIn review, um, or it could be some interview or career coaching, depending on what your goals are. So I'm going to award that at the start of August. Um, but if you haven't registered for the fourth and final session, I will put a link in the chat soon. Um, but that will be taking place next Wednesday and it will be a panel discussion with a range of people from the BGA community sharing their insights and advice on how they got a job recently throughout the pandemic and hearing from a recruitment specialist to get their insights as well. Now, just before we start, I would like to know that we have allocated more time today um, for any of your questions to get answered. So please do put them in the Q&A box throughout the webinar, and I will address these at the end and ask Alistair, and we can hopefully be able to cover all your questions at the end. Um, so without further ado, I'm really pleased to pass you over to Alistair to start the session, and um, he is just sharing his screen now. Lovely. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. And um, yeah, today's all about LinkedIn, really, and how to optimize it. Um, I'm going to explain a little bit about um, who on earth I am if you weren't on the CV session last week. Um, but as I, just to repeat to Rachel's point, really, if you've got any questions about any of the material you're about to see, please take advantage of the uh, opportunity to ask a question. Um, and uh, we'll afford some time at the end to hopefully give a decent answer as well. Um, so, um, yeah, please take advantage of that. Uh, I'm more than happy to stick around a little bit afterwards. So what qualifies me to talk with you about LinkedIn? Uh, well, apologies for the duplication. If you were on the CV session, this is going to be a little bit boring, but you might have forgotten it, I suppose. Um, I've spent the last 10 years with this business, CVIA or the uh, CV and interview advisors, long form. And in that time, I am about to hit the 45,000th CV or resume that I've reviewed and the 34,000th LinkedIn profile. Uh, and that latter number is rapidly rising. Uh, and before all of that, I was a recruiter for my sin. So at the very least, I ought to be able to give some decent insight on what makes LinkedIn work. I've used it as a recruiter. Um, I've obviously spent a lot of time looking at people's profiles, talking to recruiters, search consultants, hiring managers, trying to understand what works and what doesn't in the world of LinkedIn. And obviously, I'm going to try to impart some of that knowledge to you uh, today. The business that I represent, CVIA, um, basically exists to help people present themselves more effectively. And that's for folk looking for their first job, second, third, fourth, fifth job, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or people just looking to build a profile uh, with a small P uh, in whatever world they exist. And that's where LinkedIn's really important. It doesn't necessarily have to be about finding a job. It's really important when you're looking for a job but it's not just about finding a job. It could be because internally within an organization or an industry or a sector, you want to present yourself in an effective, compelling way. And LinkedIn is a hugely valuable tool for getting that interest. Now, as with the, the CV session, um, we always at the end of these webinars offer some great discounts on our services. So um, if that's something that uh, tweaks your interest, I'll deal with that before we head into the Q&A session. Now, I'm conscious that there will still be a few people out there who aren't on LinkedIn or maybe set up LinkedIn at some point in the distant past, maybe in recent past, but haven't really done anything with it. Um, every week I encounter people who don't use LinkedIn 
um, as maybe they should or aren't on LinkedIn. So why is it important just for the benefit of those that may still be a bit puzzled? Well, it's its size that really does matter these days. It is a case of size mattering and it's enormous. As a repository of talent, you won't find anything bigger. You will find traditional social media channels with a lot more members, but as a professional business network, um, you can't find anything bigger than LinkedIn. If you look at the big global job boards, um, they won't have as many members as LinkedIn. They certainly won't have as many unique members as LinkedIn. And if you add quite a lot of those job boards together, you still struggle to get to the number of people LinkedIn has on it, approaching and beyond now three quarters of a billion members. So it's enormous. Consequently, hiring managers, recruiters, researchers, resources, executive search consultants and such like are crawling all over it looking for people potentially like you. The biggest mistake people make with their LinkedIn profile is they think it's an electronic version of their CV, partly because they're often using it more intensively when they're looking for a job and they copy and paste the contents of their CV or resume into LinkedIn. Um, and even if you've got a good CV, that's not a great thing to do. So it's just not good practice to copy and paste your CV in great chunks or its entirety and dump it into LinkedIn. That is not the answer. Instead, we encourage our clients to view LinkedIn as the shop window to that huge area of opportunity. It's a marketplace. You won't always need it to be looking out for jobs for you, but you will need it to present you in the most effective way, possibly when you're not remotely interested in looking for opportunities, but when other people might be mapping the market so a lot of recruiters out there, they conduct market mapping exercises. They're keeping an eye out on future talent, people who may be of interest for them in the future. Now, of course, if they can't find you on LinkedIn, and we're going to come on to that in a minute, you're not going to get market mapped. You're not going to be in the picture. And if they can find you, but they don't like what they see on your profile, same end result. So LinkedIn is increasingly important. For job seeking purposes, it's as important now as your CV or resume. Fact. Used to be a few years ago, not that big a deal. Now it is a big deal. It really is important. Um, there are a lot of jobs on LinkedIn, as you probably know. If you don't, you should use it as a vehicle to find opportunities when you're in that mode. Uh, so it's increasingly becoming a bit like a job board, but it's also, as I said earlier, a really valuable place to build your profile and status, maybe for future months or years. It's really important. People use it a lot, therefore. Now, uh, I don't want to get into huge detail because this, uh, this could take a, a session in its own right, but on the screen now is uh, a snapshot of how a recruiter might use LinkedIn to find people. Um, bear in mind that if you're a professional recruiter, um, using LinkedIn as it's intended for recruiters to use it, you will be paying LinkedIn a substantial amount of money each year to gain really good, strong, granular access to its database. Most people on LinkedIn as individuals get it for free. Um, obviously, as many of you will realize, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Why do you get it for free? Because you're populating LinkedIn with some very valuable information, which of course they can sell to others. And one of their biggest customers is recruiters and search consultants and organizations who then pay LinkedIn to gain access to you and your peer group and others. LinkedIn exists because of algorithms, of course, and filters. And what you can see on the screen are basically just some examples of the filters that can be used to drill down and find people. So as I said earlier, there are three quarters of a billion people on LinkedIn, give or take a few million. So if you're starting off looking for people, of course, that's an absolute nightmare. You know. So what a recruiter or a searcher will do quickly is just use filters down the left hand side of the screen you can see 
in sort of oblongs, light blue oblongs, filters being applied to LinkedIn's universe to drill down and try and get to a more manageable number of people. And this is what people will normally do, recruiters will normally do to find someone like you. They're just going to hit the filters. So consequently, if your profile hasn't been written with these filters in mind, there's a good chance you just don't appear at all. And that's most people's problem with LinkedIn. They're just not visible. No one finds them. It's not that people don't like you. They just don't know you exist in the nicest possible way. Now, I often say on these webinars, and it is true, that if you could see a recruiter use LinkedIn in the pursuit of someone with your skills and abilities, I guarantee within minutes, seconds, moments, you'd head off to your LinkedIn profile and you'd start tweaking it, re-engineering it to suit how people actually search for folk. It's not that LinkedIn keep this a secret. It's not a secret. It's just, of course, like most things, um, individuals getting on with their lives. Um, they probably know that LinkedIn is a digital platform, of course. It's stuffed full of algorithms and that there are probably some keywords and phrases required for you to pop up in front of recruiters when they're searching for folk. I think most people know that, but they don't know how to tweak the algorithms. They don't know about the filters. They don't know what content should be arranged on their profile to encourage people to find them and to like what they see. So my main message here is that you really do have to sit down and think long and hard about what you want your profile to achieve for you and then engineer it accordingly. And obviously I'll be getting into the detail of that very shortly. So here's just another quick snapshot in terms of uh, what recruiters will be looking at just to, to give you a bit more of a clearer view. These are all the kind of things that people can do to access individuals. And of course, what they're, what they're trying to do is just drill down, drill down, drill down, drill down until they're dealing with what they perceive to be a manageable number of individuals. And that varies enormously. It could be five, it could be 100, it could be 22. I can't tell you what the right number is, but it certainly isn't three quarters of a billion people, that's for sure. So if you're... If you can see in these, uh, again, blue oblongs that are on the screen um, or ovals, um, it's the filter, the researcher, the recruiter, just using filters applied to the database in LinkedIn to bring a more manageable number of people. And they'll be looking by job titles, locations. Uh, just one little aside there on your location, if your profile set up and your uh, in the UK, for example, and you've got a profile that's pointing people to the UK, just be wary if you're looking for an opportunity outside of the UK, there's a good chance no one will ever find you. Because one of the filters will be, we only are interested in people who are currently in the country we're looking for. So a lot of people looking to get into the UK market um, are invisible because their profile is based in France or Australia or Germany or wherever. And a lot of recruiters just won't be interested in that international marketplace. I'm not saying that's always going to happen, but that is often a problem. So if you know you actively want to pursue opportunities in a different country, you need to think about LinkedIn and how it's set up. So it's a complex old beast. Um, I want to get into some of the things that really do matter um, that will affect the search capabilities of your LinkedIn profile. So this is all about optimizing your profile so that when people apply these filters, the chances of them landing on your profile and seeing you are heightened. You'll never get it 100% right. That's impossible, but you can get it a lot better than it probably is at the moment. So the sections that really do matter, and I'll be getting into these in a little bit more detail very shortly, are, if you know LinkedIn, the About section, which typically is just underneath your banner with your photo and a bit of highlight information about you. There's normally the About section. It used to be called the Summary section. For some strange reason, LinkedIn called it About. Um, calling it about doesn't really help because a lot of people use that as an excuse to say oh people want to know me my my deep inner thoughts my soul uh, and sadly no one's that bothered about that normally on linkedin so this isn't the place to tell people where you went to primary school and 
how you got your 25 meter breaststroke award um, or your cycle proficiency test. And I kid you not, some people do go wandering on about this stuff, which is of no use to the target audience at all. Um, but we'll get into that later. The experience section where you have the jobs that you've done, if you've had any jobs or um, any volunteering or any part time or anything that you've done, that's really important. The content there is going to materially affect how you appear. If you know LinkedIn, there's a separate skills and endorsement section. And I would encourage you to use all 50 of the skills you're allowed to have in that section. But you can't just don't just pick 50 random things thinking, oh, this chap on a webinar said use all 50. So I'll now just use any 50 that I can grab hold of. It's about thinking about your target audience. What do you want to be doing next? What are the skills likely to be in demand for that type of opportunity? And then claiming those if you can. Not 50 random skills. Uh, a lot of people get identified for the wrong opportunities because their skills and endorsement section is all wonky. In other words, they've put a skill in there that they don't really have or is actually irrelevant. And recruiters and searchers are using that skill as a filter and therefore you're picked up. You become visible but for the wrong reason. So in the future or any stage in that in that matter, if you're ever picked up for opportunities, people are trying to connect with you or discuss opportunities with you that just of no interest to you. One of the indicators to take from that is that maybe the skills in your skills and endorsement section are a bit wonky and they need sorting out. In that skill section, you can reorder them. And it is important that the most relevant, important ones are at the top of the pile. There is an algorithm ticking around in uh, LinkedIn that looks at the order of the skills. It, it sort of crudely assumes that the one at the bottom is less important than the one at the top. So, of course, if you've got the wrong scale and it's at the top of the list, you're just pointing the wrong people in your general direction. There's a lot you can do to engineer LinkedIn to your advantage. If you know you're going to be targeting particular sectors, industries, or even organizations, join groups that represent the interest of that entity. There are lots of them on LinkedIn. In fact, there are so many, it's impossible to list them all. If you're interested in something, I pretty much guarantee that there'll be a group on LinkedIn that shares that interest. Join those groups. One of the benefits of that is you become visible to all group members. And there may be some very interesting people, some decision makers, some recruiters, some search consultants in those groups. But it also enhances the visibility of your profile, because, again, it assumes that you're taking more of an interest in that particular world or environment. Now, if you're in a, a sector right now, let's say, I don't know, you're in finance and accounting and for some reason you want to get into um, oil and gas. Uh, you really ought to be joining groups that share that interest, the oil and gas interest, particularly if you're going around the world or your environment suggesting to people that you're desperately interested in the oil and gas sector. Honest, 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 please believe me. Um, it's dead easy these days to go onto LinkedIn and just see whether that's true. And if you're not belonging to any of these groups, you get found out. And this actually does affect people. Lots of people say, no, I'm really, really keen. Please give me the break. Give me the chance. OK, well, if that's true, where is it evidenced? Now, LinkedIn provides the opportunity to evidence that interest. With specific organisations, follow them. Uh, on entry level roles in particular, companies can filter. If you're not interested in them crudely, they're not going to be interested in you. I'm not suggesting that happens all the time, by the way, but it is a filter for a lot of entry level roles. Graduate entry level roles often will be a uh, very high volume of applicants. A lot of companies will just say, well, look, um, we can't deal with 5000 people. So let's just reduce it by doing something. We know in that 5000, there's going to be there. There's going to be some good people, but they don't want to deal with 5000 anything. So if, if they could just halve that, that's of interest to them. So they may say, right, get rid of anybody who's not following us. Now, you know, if you're applying for an opportunity, you know you're going to be interested in that organization. Just follow them on LinkedIn, even if it's temporarily. In an ideal world, as you build your profile and connect with others, 
the best connections to have are those in your peer group. Not the only connections, but the most valuable connections will be those in your peer group. And this particularly carries weight as your career develops. Now, peer group, just for the audience of doubt, because I mentioned this last night on a webinar to a different audience, and someone quite rightly said, what on earth is my peer? Who, what do you mean? What is a peer? Uh, it, it's people in the same environment as you, doing the same kind of role at the same kind of level with the same kind of skills so far as you can judge. And as you progress, this is why it becomes more and more important, as you progress throughout your career, having those connections increases the weight of your profile, the gravitas, if you like. It just tweaks one of those algorithms. Um, and ideally, rather than, you know, LinkedIn, the whole point is to be connected with people who are connected, who are people with connections, et cetera, et cetera. And you have degrees of connection. It stands to reason those first degree connections where you're directly connected to someone of interest are the best ones to have. This takes time. Of course, it's not something you can do overnight. Following target companies, you can do overnight. Joining groups that share interests as to where you're heading, you can do that overnight. But building your network of connections takes a little bit more of a plan. But do think about it. Do spend a bit of time on it. Invest some time in building those connections. They will pay you dividends in the future. So. That's the kind of broader stuff. Let's get into the detail. There are some really important areas to LinkedIn. I mean, there's a lot of important areas, but the ones that really matter, I'm going to go through now. I touched on a couple of them, the about section, the experience section. But what I didn't mention was the bit right at the top of your profile where the banner images and your photo should be. And you really ought to have a photo these days. Uh, in the UK included, strange. In the UK, on a CV or a resume, do not put your photo. But LinkedIn, definitely do so, unless you fear some discrimination or other murky subject. Uh, and then it's a balance call. You have to make a judgment on that. Um, if you're going to have a photo, professional head and shoulders shot. When I say professional, you don't need to spend vast sums of money on it. It just needs to look appropriate. So here's an example. This is this chap, Matt, who runs this business. Um, his photo, neutral background. There are three characteristics, neutral background, suitable business attire. You could argue that's, we could argue all sorts of things. This is where it gets subjective, but it's non-threatening. It's neutral in Matt's case. Um, and it's head and shoulders shot. It's inoffensive in other words, unless you just don't like the look of Matt and there's nothing he can do about that, I'm afraid. Um, so uh, <laughs> it just is what it is. The key thing here, though, the important bit, I jest, but it is important, is that plenty of people get rejected having done a lot of the hard work from job opportunities because of that photo. And that you might say, well, hang on a minute, the world's a better place. You shouldn't discriminate. It's not about discrimination. It's about personal brand, your image, how people see you. Now, the bad examples, because you might be wondering, what on earth would you have to do to get rejected from a job opportunity? Um, well, obviously, there's some very dodgy things, but you'd be arrested for that kind of stuff. What I'm talking about is the amazing number of people who pinch a photo off social media. Now, it might, you might be lucky and it might look like Matt's neutral background, suitable business attire, head and shoulders shot. That's fine. What I'm talking about is you on a mountainside, you in some exotic sports car or sat on the bonnet of an exotic sports car. These are all real examples. You stood full body length, some distance from the camera and bizarrely holding your camera, taking a picture of the person, taking a picture of you. That's real. It's happened. What on earth the person was thinking of, God only knows, but it's happened. You with any other human being, because then it's, well, who's the person, the profile? You might think you know, obviously you would know. The audience is thinking, where's the person? Who owns the profile? So be very careful about the photo. Your audience, because if you get to the sharp end of the recruitment process, the long list or the short list, your audience are likely as not these days to check you out on LinkedIn. They might not do when you apply for a job, but they certainly will do if you're on the sharp end of that process. And if they don't like the cut of your jib in terms of the view being, well, if you're going to present yourself like this, 
we're not interested. That happens a lot. Now, the banner image, if you're on LinkedIn, the default banner image is a green, mushy rectangle. It used to be a blue rectangle, but it's now green and rather insipid. Change it. It should be something that reflects your personal brand. Now, Matt running, runs a business, therefore his banner is promoting his business. You may not be running a business, but you'll be doing something professionally or targeting something professionally that can be better presented than a green, mushy rectangle. A lot of people after these webinars change the color of the rectangle and then will email me and say, thanks, Alistair, great webinar. I've changed my banner image. What do you think? And I go to it. It's now a maroon rectangle. <laughs> I'm thinking it's not that it's green that there's a problem. The fact is it's just insipid and doesn't present anything about you unless you're in the business of selling green rectangles. So change it to something that better reflects what you're about. There are lots of options on LinkedIn. Could be spreadsheets, calculators, a skyscape. You know, just change it to something that's not a green rectangle, but at least creates an image that is neutral or positive so far as you can imagine. If you really run out of road, uh, or particularly if you ever create your own brand, run a business or something, these things can be created bespoke to you and your requirements. So it's very important. I've dwelled on that because it actually it's so innocent. A lot of people just breeze by it, but a picture paints a thousand words. So leverage that power. Then under your name, in that banner area, there's what's called the headline. It's the bit of text underneath your name. Most people just stick in whatever they're currently doing. And there may be no harm in that, but you've got to think, is that the best message that can be presented to my target audience? So in an ideal world, you need to be describing what you are, but not necessarily just if you've got a job, what your title is, because that may not be of most appeal to whoever you're targeting. It might not be the end of the world, but there'll be lots of people calling themselves the same thing that you are and working at businesses that are similar to the one that you're working in, if it is just job title and employer, which is what most people do. Our argument is it can be a lot more compelling. It should be, yes, what you are and what do you have to offer? And I'll show you an example in a minute. We call this a value proposition. And if you're on the CV webinar, you might remember this. It's your professional reason for existence. And that's different from just your job title employer, which is quite boring with all due respect. When you're looking for a role and you know you're going to be looking for a role, you really do need to think about what your target audience will be looking for not just what you are, because they may not be looking for what you are. They'll be looking for something else. If you're working for a prestigious company, a well-known company, fine. There's no harm in having it referenced in your professional headline if you think it's going to carry some weight. But if you work for a business no one's ever heard of or worse, has a poor reputation, don't feature it in this area of your LinkedIn profile. So to give you an example, uh, a good few years ago, the guys and gals doing all the hard work in our business, writing CVs and LinkedIn profiles, they probably would have called themselves. In fact, they did call themselves. Uh, their name was at the top and their professional headline would be CV writer at CVIA Limited, which is the legal entity that we work for. That doesn't mean a great deal, though, does it? No, not many people wake up in the morning thinking, oh, I need a CV writer in my life. I, mean, I wish they did, but they don't. And no one's ever heard of CVIA Limited unless you've been on one of these webinars or engaged with our services already. So that's not the most compelling piece of information that's going to appeal to our target audience, which brutally are people like you. However, now, if you went to one of our team, you'll find this text underneath their name. So Joe Bloggs, personal branding specialist. Uh, by the way, a lot of people search for personal branding. Very few people search for CV writers. A lot more people search for personal branding. So that works to our advantage. And then the remaining text, which you can read for yourselves, is the value proposition. Why should someone be interested in Joe Blogs? Because they can do something that will significantly increase interviews and job offers. That's the killer phrase. 
people do wake up in the morning wishing they get more interviews and job offers. They don't know what they might need to achieve that other than more, in, uh, more interviews and job offers, of course. But if someone exists in the world who might be able to get them more interviews and job offers, suddenly Joe Bloggs becomes a whole lot more interesting. People want to connect with him or her. And that's how it works. And that's the text that now we use and we recommend not that precise text we recommend our clients use, of course, but the sentiment. Think of those words, think of the positioning, make it more sexy, more compelling. Then remember I said right in the early stages of this session that you really do need to focus on the about section. This is the first section normally on most people's profile after that banner, image, header, photo bit. And what most people do is they take an introductory paragraph that they may already have on their CV and they dump it into LinkedIn. And as I've said already, that is not a clever idea. One reason why it's not clever is because, actually there are two key reasons. The first is most people's CVs are truly awful. So copying that text into LinkedIn just makes your LinkedIn profile awful. I'm sorry, but that's just statistically true. Second reason is LinkedIn and CVs are different. Your CV is, and you'll recognize this if you were on the webinar last week, your CV is a laser guided or should be a laser guided missile on a specific opportunity tailored for that specific role. You might have three versions of your CV that are going out because you could do three different types of role. So the obvious question is, which version would you copy into LinkedIn if that's what you're going to do? How can you address those three different types of role if you've only got one profile? It's a logical question. The answer is you've got to cover those three areas on LinkedIn. Any one CV should only touch on one of the jobs, but LinkedIn's got to cover all three. It's different, therefore. So we've got a little formula that we recommend you adopt to deal with the about section. This is just the about section. So on a CV, fine, having an introductory paragraph. In the about section of LinkedIn, you're probably going to have six, seven sections to it. Quite a lot of text, a lot more text than would be on the CV. Now, if you're thinking, yeah, but will anybody read it all? It's not about whether they read it all, truthfully. This is about tweaking those algorithms. The systems out there, all the digital stuff, couldn't care less how much text you throw at it. It's hoovering up that information in nanoseconds and making important decisions. So there's a balance to be had. You can't have war and peace dumped in here, partly because there is a character limit. I think it's 2,000 characters you've got to play with. But neither should you be looking for brevity. Because the digital systems want to hoover up that important, compelling data. So you need to feed it. But accept that there needs to be a balance for the human eye to pick up on the core content as well. So who sees works really well. The who bit is precisely who and what you are. An extension of that professional headline that we just talked about. I'll show you um, some information later that will explain this a bit better. But it basically is that, that descriptor of what you are. It should be probably a little paragraph. What have you got to offer the world? The first three lines, I'll probably repeat this in a minute, the first three lines of this text are super important because that's all you see by default when you land on someone's profile for the first time. So that's a paragraph. The first of the S's are the strengths that you possess that are likely to be of interest to your target audience. So you've always got to have a mind on the who might be interested in me, who am I interested in targeting? What are they likely to want to see? Give them a couple of examples. So you've got a couple of strengths, maybe three, but something like that, and then some examples of where those strengths were evidenced. So you're now up to possibly five or six little sections. Ideally, you want to be explaining the sentiment of this section of your profile ought to be 
what am I going to be able to help you with? This becomes more and more relevant as your career progresses. Basically, things that I can do will give you comfort. Will allow you to get more sleep. One of the things we often recommend to people is think about it like this. What's keeping companies up at night or their management teams? What's causing them the stress? What's causing them the worry? Is there anything you can do, metaphorically speaking, to give them a better night's sleep? And if you can articulate it in a nice, friendly way, that's a pretty good way of looking at this section. And here's an example. If you're experiencing underperformance in such and such, or if you've upgraded from system A to system B and you're having a right old mare of it, I can help deliver solutions. I can help deal with this. I can help reduce the pain. That's the kind of sentiment this section should be taking. Uh, the second of the E's is a bit more about you, what makes you tick, your ethos, in other words. LinkedIn can afford more personality. The, the CV ought to be very clinical. There's no place for that. And if you were on the webinar last time, you remember I was quite scathing about using soft personal behavioral skills and attributes. LinkedIn slightly different. You can take a little bit more of a casual approach, a conversational approach, if you like. And the final S, skills. Now, I said earlier, and you might know, there's a separate skills and endorsement section, and you should use all 50 of them if you can. You might think, well, why would you replicate any of those within the about section? And that's the whole point. You ought to replicate the key skills because that's going to help with that digital filtering approach that many people will be taking with your profile. So there you go, who sees who and what you are, a couple of strengths, some examples of where those strengths have been evidenced. You'd be amazed how many people, particularly those people who have got a role that's very easy to measure, salespeople in particular, salespeople, marketers, uh, finance and accounting folk, They'll often say, oh, my duty, my responsibility was to, like with a salesperson, I, my responsibility was to hit sales targets. And that's it. Now, any sales director, commercial director or HR person will be thinking, well, did you actually hit the targets? Did you meet those expectations? They want to know that. You've got to be able to give some examples of your work. A bit about you, your ethos and some skills, duplicate the core skills that you possess within this area of the LinkedIn profile. So it'll be a lot more text than you'd have on any one CV. Very important section. When it comes to your experience, here are all the things that would be on a CV and in brackets is whether they'd also be on LinkedIn. Now, you don't really need to know the detail or remember the detail right now necessarily. The key message here is there is less information in the experience section of LinkedIn than you would have on a CV or resume. Less. It'd be more of a summary. Not completely devoid of information, but much less information than you'd have on a CV. Another reason why not to copy and paste CVs into LinkedIn. Much more of a summary and much more focused, by the way, on deliverables and achievements. So, again, LinkedIn's quite different. Just for the benefit and a reminder, I don't want to get into the detail, but just to remind anybody who was on the session last week um, or indeed wasn't and just wants to know what a good CV looks like, uh, on the right hand side of the screen is page one of a CV that's structured in a way that achieves a great result, because we know we've been doing it long enough. There are three key sections, introductory profile summary, a paragraph, bullet pointed key skills, and then three career highlights written in a particular way. You may remember the STAR methodology, situation, task, actions, result. Now, if you map that across to LinkedIn, the profile summary is the about section on LinkedIn, but quite different. So the about section would be about textually three or four times the amount of text you can see on this CV. Different. The key skills, those particular key skills, if they're always the relevant ones, they would also be in the about section. 
and then they'd be duplicated in the skills and endorsement section on LinkedIn. And the career highlights, the evidence of what you've been up to that would compel the reader to think, yes, this person's a valid, credible candidate. They can map over into LinkedIn into what's called the project section. Talk more about that imminently. Anybody, by the way, that style of CV was for people who've had some experience, be it a year or even a few months. Uh, anybody who's not got any experience looking for their first level of role where you can't have career highlights because you've not had a career, um, just for the benefit of those people, there's a shot on screen now of Joe Bloggs looking for his first proper job as an accountant or similar accounts assistant or something like that. Um, slightly different approach. Education is still important, still an opening profile summary statement. And those star-based career highlights, which you can't have career highlights if you've not had a proper career, become converted into demonstrable evidence of core competences that you believe the target audience is interested in. In this particular case, you can see five competences have been identified, financial management, operational management, entrepreneurialism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then using STAR, situation, task, actions, result, to structure content that evidences where those competences were achieved or acquired, no matter when, no matter where, but there's evidence to prove that, for example, Joe is an entrepreneur, or rather has entrepreneurialism skills, which is often sought on entry-level roles. And there's nothing wrong with people looking out to start on in their career, or being on LinkedIn, by the way. There's never, I say that, is there? Legally, you've got to be 16 and above to be on LinkedIn, technically, again, uh, for their uh, TNC. There's nothing to stop anybody 16 plus being on LinkedIn. And I would advise you get on there sooner rather than later if you're not already on it. Now, let's get into those star based uh, career highlights or case studies in a little bit more detail because these can be brought across to LinkedIn and used very well. So, um, everyone likes a story as long as it's uh, fact, not fiction. We recommend heartily the use of case studies on the CV or resume and then on LinkedIn. And as I've just said, we use star, situation, task, actions, result to build the text on the screen in the right way. The, <laughs> the white rectangle uh, is some text that is a case study that belongs to Matt, the guy that runs this business. It really did happen. And it's a star based career highlight or case study. Um, the first sentence is always the situation, what was going on. The second sentence is always the task. What was Matt doing at the time? What was his the responsibility resting on his shoulders? So in this case, uh, he was given the task of sales and operations manager. The bulk of the remaining text are the actions he took. And the final sentence is the result, the R of star, what actually happened. These are very powerful. They work really well if they're relevant to the audience's requirements. And that's the key thing. So the word of caution here is make sure they're relevant. You can't just invent three or repeat three things that happened in your life. By the way, three is the magic number on a CV for anybody with any experience. Three of these is enough on page one. And then you can bring these across onto LinkedIn and I'll show you how in a minute. So these are very powerful. They're compelling. They're full of rich content, but they, of course, they appeal to the human eye, the recruiting manager, the hiring manager, whoever. They've got to be relevant, though. You can't just use a number of examples, bit three or whatever, uh, that are randomly selected because you enjoy doing something or you think it might be appropriate. They've got to be relevant to the audience. Otherwise, they're going to read them and think, well, big deal. We're not interested in this. Of what use is this to us? To always think about the relevance. Now, so far as LinkedIn is concerned, um, here we've got, we've got Matt again in his profile. He's wanting to add these case studies to the area of LinkedIn where they will be fitting very well, which is called the project section. Now, this needs to be added to your profile. So you go to your profile, you click on the add profile section button highlighted. And then down the drop down, you'll find projects and you add that to your LinkedIn. 
profile and then you populate that case study content into your profile and they will appear in a separate section. Now, the beauty of LinkedIn is you can tuck away as many as you like in there. On a CV, you should only have three. Once you're getting into a job, we've got any kind of career, three is that magic number. But on LinkedIn, you can have loads of the things. That's the beauty of LinkedIn. Again, though, difference between CV and LinkedIn. Uh, we're not far of being off done now. Um, and therefore, I always just pause here to remind if you've got any questions to ask, ask away because we'll soon be into that phase of the uh, webinar. Um, but for those starting to think, I do really need help, particularly if you were on the CV session and we're just they're looking for confirmation that you may need help. Um, the indicators for help is relatively simple. Uh, as I said in the CV session, if you're not getting interviews, when you send off that CV and you know you can perform the role, that suggests the CV is not cutting through. It's not communicating the message that you so desperately want it to communicate. That can be fixed. So as long as you can genuinely perform the role in question, you can put together a message strong enough to get you more interviews, but it is the message that's the problem. So that's, that's easy to deal with. LinkedIn, same situation, really. You can use LinkedIn to apply for jobs. And if you're doing that, but getting rejected, your LinkedIn profile is not suggesting the right things. It's not engineered properly. Conversely, if you're not getting people approach you through LinkedIn, once you've set up your profile and you're portraying what you're about and what you've got to offer the world, if that's not generating some level of interest from recruiters or organizations, that would suggest, firstly, that no one's probably finding you. And secondly, if they are, they don't like what they see. That can be fixed too. So use those as the indicators. Then if you're struggling, fix the problem. Don't sit on your hands thinking something will change anytime soon, because sadly it's unlikely to do so. Now, obviously you can fix things yourself or you can come to us for help. And if you're interested in that latter option, this is how that service works. We, we match you up with one of our team, one of our personal branding specialists. Um, they'll spend time with you hoovering the raw data from you that we need to be able to present you in a more effective way and then set about that task. We're not inventing stuff about you. We're just literally listening to what you want to do, where you want to head. What have you got in your toolkit at this moment in time to make that transitional move and then present that effectively via a CV and a LinkedIn profile. If you do that well, you'll get better results. It's a robust process. It's proven. We've done it thousands and thousands of times now we know it works but sadly it does cost money and i'll shortly explain how much money it does cost uh, final thing i wanted to mention about linkedin just as i mentioned during the cv session uh, is to do with recommendations testimonial evidence now if you know linkedin well enough you'll know that you can gain and gather recommendations from third parties um, about your qualities and abilities. As in the CV session, I mentioned this phrase, social proofing. Um, it's real. You'll do it. You'll engage with products and services and brands that you have researched online typically or sought the opinion of others before engaging with said product, services or brand. It's common sense, logical. It's just the same in the recruitment scene. So if you've got people on LinkedIn where you can gather these automatically, saying that you are truly a good egg, so to speak, that's going to help you. It literally will help you because the algorithms like recommendations, so that's going to help you, but also the human eye likes recommendations. If there's someone on there saying that you truly are good at what you do or that actually you do have some of those soft personal attributes, things like enthusiasm, dedication, passion, drive, which I was so scathing of when I said, please do not put them on your LinkedIn profile. Do not put them on your CV. If someone else is attributing those skills to you, that carries a lot more weight. But ideally, you want recommendations from people who've worked with you, hired you, managed you. Those are the ideal ones. If you've got your infamous Aunt Maud, guardian, parent, friend, relative saying you're really nice, you deserve a chance, 
lovely though that is, not very helpful in the world of commerce and recruitment, sadly. Not hideous, but just not as valuable as someone who's actually seen you in the world of work or similar, who can bear testimony to your abilities. So gather recommendations, make it your life's work. Well, not quite your life's work, but make a note. Make sure that you encourage people throughout your career to recommend you on LinkedIn for as long as the platform exists. They will help you. You can take that information across to your CV. One or two examples would be lovely, but having them on LinkedIn is a very powerful thing to have. So that concludes the main session. I hope you found it useful. If you're on the CV session, you'll remember I concluded with these uh, packages that we have to offer. Uh, there's been the addition of one on the far right hand side. So these are exactly the same deals that were presented a week or so ago um, with one addition, which is if you are just interested in getting your LinkedIn profile sorted at any stage in the not too distant, we can do that in isolation. Just as we could write your CV in isolation as well, as a matter of fact. Um, but there are three things there that tend to hit most people's requirements. On far left, we write a CV and your LinkedIn profile with three star-based case studies positioning you in a particular direction. In the middle, we have exactly the same, but we give you some more case studies. So seven instead of three. That gives you the flexibility to pitch yourself at different audiences. You pick the three best star-based case studies you can and put them on the CV that goes off. Obviously, you've got seven to choose from. It makes life a little bit more flexible. And on the right-hand side, we'll write you just a LinkedIn profile targeting the kind of roles that you're interested in, and you'll get three star, three star case studies as a, as a part of that package. Those offers reside at the URL that you can see at the base of the screen. You put that into your browser, visit a special page, select the offer, and then we'll look after you. And those offers expire at the end of the month. So you've got a bit of time to think about it if that is pertinent to your circumstances. So thank you for your time. I hope you found that useful. I think Rachel's probably got a few questions she wants to bounce in my general direction. So uh, Rachel, if you're there and can uh, bounce them, please do so. Absolutely. Thank you, Elsa. That was, that was a great session. And, you know, it certainly relates really well to the session that you ran last week. Um, so members, please do send your questions through on the Q&A chat now and we can address them. Um, my first one for you, Elsa, is mm. from one of our members called Sophie and she is in France. And she was wondering when she has her LinkedIn profile in two different languages. What's some of your advice that you could give her about making sure that her profile set up for that search engine optimization that you've been talking about. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. Um, so there are a couple of things just to be wary of, Sophie. Um, always think about your target audience. So um, if it's the two critical areas that matter, one is literally the area. So if you're looking to go into a new country or territory, uh, as best you can set up the profile with that in mind. So, you know, when you set up your profile, you need to set it with a geographic location. So, for example, mine's UK, of course. Um, but if I wanted to move to Saudi Arabia, it would be advisable for me to reset that so that um, it appears as if my profile is based in Saudi Arabia, which you can do um, because that increases the chances of you getting visible. When it comes to the language, um, obviously it doesn't really matter what your language is unless you know that you're targeting an audience which deals in a particular language. So again, if you were targeting work in the UK and your profile currently isn't set up in the English language, you need to do something about that because um, uh, yeah, the UK is not renowned for its um, language skills. <laughs> Uh, to put it diplomatically. So if you are targeting the average recruiter 
or organization in the UK and you were hitting them with, I don't know, French or Spanish or uh, Mandarin or something, um, it's, it's going to probably just be an instant giveaway that you're nowhere near England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, and you'll probably suffer as a consequence. Um, so that's the second element. It's just think about what your audience is likely to respond to. So far as the search engine optimization of any of the profiles, all the things that you've seen apply in whatever language, all the algorithms are the same. Um, they're all achieving the same thing. The way the recruiters use LinkedIn is always the same, no matter the language. So it's all about this filtering. So just think about the actual content. Doesn't matter what the language is, the words, the phrases, the content needs to be appropriate and relevant to the audience. But particularly on those, um, on that international, if you're looking for roles outside of wherever you live, just be wary that your audience will see exactly what you've presented. And if they're working in a different country, that may be to your disadvantage. I hope that helps. Perfect. Sophie's just said, thank you. That's great. So my next question comes from Raquel, who is calling in from Trinidad and Tobago. So her question was around how you said around that social proof. In terms of asking people for providing a recommendation on LinkedIn, um, is this advisable to do this with one of your mentors and how that recommendation might look? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, there's, there's very few bad recommendations that could be had unless, <laughs> and you know by the very nature of them they're being recommendations you don't tend to find people being critical of someone which is useful but yeah there's not there's when, when I sort of mentioned this a little bit earlier and I, I, and I sort of said just be wary of who's recommending you um, it's a bit like uh, any news is good news and it's a bit like a recommendation if you've got nothing else Having one from a mentor, absolutely fine. In fact, a mentor is pretty good in the great scheme of things because they'll know you and they'll know you. It depends on what they've mentored you in, but I'm, I'm assuming it's in some kind of professional capacity. But if it's not professional, if it's a personal mentor uh, or an academic mentor, absolutely fine because they'll still be able to give some valuable information. And that very fact that it exists is going to help you. It's better than having zero. Um, now, as a slight aside, so first of all, definitely get it from a mentor. That's worth having. They may sometimes will say, well, look, would you recommend something that I could say or that I'd be happy in saying? They may not want to write it themselves. Some people say, well, look, you give me the text that you would like me to write. They'll just review it. And if they're happy with it, they then gladly provide it. Be prepared for that. That's entirely acceptable. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'd say definitely go for it. And, and, and get that information. Uh, just be wary that there are some people working in organizations as a bit of an aside, this is not so much to do with mentors, this is just a fact. There are some people working in organizations where it's part of their contractual employment that they cannot give testimonial evidence or references or recommendations at all. All of that has to be fed through a personnel or human resources department. Um, and that's for, various legal reasons and protection reasons. Um, now you can't fight that. So if you ever come across someone you know who managed you and they say, I'm sorry, I can't provide that information. Don't take that personally, unless they say it's because they don't like you, of course. They may not be, they may be obliged rather to not provide that information. And if so, just accept that, move on and ask someone else. Lovely. Thank you. So we've actually got two members that have their hands up. So Sean, I'll, I'll let you speak now and you can certainly ask your question directly to Alistair. I'm not actually sure if that's going to let me work. Um, perhaps John and Patience, I know you've got your hand up to ask a question. If you still have a question, please type them into the Q&A box now and then I can ask it on your behalf. Okay, I'll take that as 
they've all, all done with their questions. So thank you so much, Alistair. And we're bang on one hour now. So we've, we've done really well for perfect timing. Um, and all BGA members, I did put a link there for next week's session, which will be the panel discussion. And that will conclude our BGA Careers Month. So thank you for joining us. And thank you, Alistair, for all of your insights today and last week as well. And we will catch you again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody.